Uh, thanks very much for the invitation, and it's nice to see a bunch of friends, even virtually. Uh, I want to talk about some joint work with Adam Day. Um, here's the summary of what I'm going to talk about. There's a conjecture in descriptive set theory characterizing what functions are piecewise continuous. And we prove the conjecture assuming pi 1, 2 determinacy. Adam and I started thinking about this conjecture some time ago. There's a beautiful uh, paper of Kihara from 2015 where he showed how you could use Shore and Slayman's generalization of the Posner-Robinson theorem to the higher levels of the Turing jump to get a bunch of information about this conjecture. And eventually working on the problem led us um, in an unexpected direction. Our proof of this problem, this conjecture in boldface descriptive set theory uses priority arguments. And in particular, it uses um, Antonio Montalban's true stages machinery to uh, run some construction of a continuous function um, to prove this theorem in boldface descriptive set theory. So I want to talk a, a bit about that, um, how you can do priority arguments in descriptive set theory and um, where they've arised before, uh, before I start talking about um, piecewise continuity and the proof of decomposability. Okay, so Here's something uh, I was quite wrong about. Um, Adam showed me um, in 2007-ish, maybe, a bunch of cool stuff he was starting to do with the two stages machinery. And I was a little bit unimpressed. I used to think that frameworks for doing priority arguments um, weren't so interesting and had little value. Um, maybe part of this is because when I was growing up, I did a computer science. Um, as an undergrad, and some of what I saw there was this backlash against software engineering, um, this idea that you can't um, sort of systematize and make good frameworks for doing all possible computer programs because they have limitless complexity beyond any tr kind of framework you want to encapsulate all of them in. This is like Dijkstra's um, so-called radical novelty of, of computer programming. But um, I was very wrong about this, I think, now. Um, true stages now, in my opinion, are exactly the precise tool you need to understand how membership in a sigma zero n set is witnessed. And part of um, their um, essential nature is that they were discovered independently by Louveau and Saint-Ramon in descriptive set theory. Um, this was around 1988 when they proved Borel wage determinacy in second order arithmetic. It had been a problem for a while whether you could prove wage determinacy for Borel sets in some simple system or well, whether like Borel determinacy you need infinitely many iterates of the power set operation. And so in proving this, they needed to very deeply understand Borel sets. And for that purpose, they basically invented the true stages machine. Nobody realized this. I don't even think they would call what they were doing a priority argument. But the connection was realized quite recently by Noam Greenberg and Dan Tretzky and Adam Day. Um, part of what I'm going to do is talk about a theorem precisely characterizing when a set is sigma zero and complete and the characterization uses true stages. In, in a very precise sense, true stages are exactly the way to understand uh, boldface sigma zero n sets. Okay, so I'm gonna give a very easy example of uh, the theorem first and prove it. It'll be just the finite injury case of a much more general theorem. And to do that, I'm gonna introduce a little bit of background about the Borel hierarchy so let me just remind you of a few things in that setting. So a Polish space is some <coughs> topological space that admits a topology generated by a complete metric. Um, for example, the real numbers or Cantor space or bare space. 
or the continuous functions on zero one with the uniform convergence topology. If you want for the whole talk, you can just pretend we're working inside Cantor space and that's fine with me. Um, we define the Borel hierarchy as usual. The sigma zero one sets are the open sets. Um, a set is pi zero alpha it's, if it's the complement of a sigma zero alpha set and sigma zero alpha sets are precisely the cannibal unions of pi zero beta sets where you have beta less than alpha. This is the familiar picture that we know from uh, say the arithmetical hierarchy and computability theory and of course in a precise sense the relativization of the arithmetical hierarchy to all possible real parameters gives the exactly the Borel sets of finite rank. Okay, so we're working with the Borel hierarchy and the way we compare complexity in that setting is with wage reducibility. So here we say A is wage reducible to a set B if there is a continuous reduction from A to B. So there's some continuous function F from X to Y so that for all reals X in X, we have X is inside A if and only if it's image F of X is in B. And if you like, this is some um, this provides reducibility uh, very much like reducibilities in computability theory like Turing reducibility or TT reducibility. Um, but the wage hierarchy has a very different feel from those uh, computability theoretic reducibilities, even though there are precise connections between them. And part of that is due to wages lemma. things are much more nicely behaved in this setting than in computability theory. Wages Lemma says that the wage hierarchy forms some well quasi order where there aren't infinite descending sequences or infinite antichains. In fact, um, antichains have a maximum size of two and uh, at the very beginning of the wage hierarchy would be the universal clopen set and then the universal sigma zero one and universal pi zero one set. And then you could take a disjoint union of a complete sigma zero one and pi zero one set. And then the next level would be a complete difference of open sets. This is um, kind of like if you take many one reducibility and uh, computability theory, you'd have um, the complete C set and co C set, and then you'd have the difference hierarchy built on top of that. And in fact, there is a precise relationship between the wage hierarchy and natural many one degrees. This is the work of Kihara Montalban. Um, for example, something which seems quite foreign if your intuitions come from computability theory is that if you have a sigma zero n set and it's not pi zero n, then in fact it has to be sigma zero n complete. I guess I should say something about um, completeness because that's going to be important for what comes next. Recall we say a set B is sigma zero alpha hard if every sigma zero alpha set reduces to B. And it's complete if it's both sigma zero alpha and sigma zero alpha hard. So what I'm going to be talking about in a minute is theorems characterizing sigma zero alpha hardness. But if you like, you can just think about characterizing sigma zero alpha completeness. I just don't need in the theorem to assume the sets that I'm dealing with are sigma zero alpha themselves. I just want to make theorems characterizing when every sigma zero alpha set reduces to some other set B. Okay. So I want to give the very simplest priority argument in boldface recursion theory that I can. And 
it's going to be a abstraction of some folklore technique that everyone uses when they prove sets of sigma zero three complete. Um, but before I get to the theorem, let me go back a second. I need two more basic definitions. So if we have a set in a Polish space, it's meager if it's contained in a countable union of nowhere dense sets. And co-meager if it's complement is meager. Um, meager and co-meager sets are the natural topological notions of smallness and largeness. And the definition might look um, a little strange if it's been a while since you've seen it, but the idea is that um, at maybe a first approximation, density is some notion of topological largeness. Um, and nowhere density is a notion of topological smallness. But those properties have a defect that you can take a countable union, for example, of nowhere dense sets, and then it becomes dense. For instance, the rationals, each individual rational number is a nowhere dense set, but uh, all of them together are dense. And so to fix that issue, we just close off under countable, countable unions. Um, since every nowhere dense set um, is contained in a closed nowhere dense set. Um, we have this characterization of co-meagerness, which I'll use. A set is co-meager if there's countably many dense open sets whose intersection is contained inside the set. And if you like, one way of thinking about this is that if you're going to make some element inside X by approximation uh, using a decreasing sequence of open sets, being co-meager means along the way, you can, at any time you like, meet some countable collection of dense sets to end up inside B. And that's the way that we're going to be using co-meagerness. That's also what I just said informally is the proof of the bare category theorem, which says that co-meager sets are non-empty. So it, it, it isn't a completely trivial notion of largeness and smallness. Okay, so that's meagerness and co-meagerness. Um, here's just a technical notion just for the theorem. I'm going to be dealing with countable collections of closed sets. And I want this countable collection to have some very simple closure properties. For instance, I want my collection of closed sets to be closed under finite intersections. If I intersect any two elements of the family, it's also in the family. And I also want something further. If I take an open set and it intersects one of my closed sets, then I can find a further set in my family that's contained inside that intersection. So for example, if I take the light face pi zero one sets are good. If you pick a finite binary string and you have some pi zero one set where that finite string can be extended to live inside the pi zero one set then uh, restricting just to extensions of that finite string forms another pi zero one set witnessing this property. Okay, so here's the folklore theorem. If I have a subset of a Polish space, it's sigma zero three hard, if and only if there's a good collection of closed sets so some closed sets just having these two simple closure properties. And now these two additional requirements give me enough capability to reduce a complete sigma zero three set to A. So I, I need some way of ensuring that a point that I build is not an A and another way of ensuring that a point that I build is an A. And here are the two components. I need to make sure that X is an element of infinitely many of these closed sets, and X is not an A. And also, for each closed set in my collection, A is co-meager in Fn. 
Okay. So when I say Comeager and FN, by the way, this is in the relative topology. All right. So the interesting thing about this theorem to me is the if and only if here, really. It's not that surprising that um, the direction here is true. Because if you go looking through the literature and you read proofs of sigma zero three completeness, like the set of absolutely normal numbers is sigma zero three complete or completeness about effective Hausdorff dimension or so on. They're all doing this idea. You find some countable collection of closed sets you're gonna use for approximations in your continuous function. Often they're interesting fractals and you show that they have these nice uh, properties that you can use uh, to make sure that if you meet enough dense sets inside one of those closed sets, you end up outside of your set but if you meet infinitely many of those closed sets, you're inside the set. And um, what's most interesting about the theorem to me is the other direction. It's that this is precisely the only way you can prove a set is sigma zero three complete. Um, you're always finding these closed sets and then proving these simple density properties about them. And then there is a couple paragraphs at the end of your proof where you do the priority argument that I'm about to do. So let me do it in general, and then it never has to be done again. All right, so here's a proof sketch. It's a finite injury argument, uh, much like if you prove some index set, say the, the RE sets that are cofinite is sigma zero three complete, that's a finite injury. And you would get an infinite injury when you go to sigma zero four and zero triple prime injury when you go to sigma zero five and so on. Okay, so what I need to do to prove this direction is reduce a sigma zero three complete set to A, assuming there are these closed sets that live inside the space that have these nice properties with respect to A. All right, so here's the complete set that I'm gonna choose. The set of real numbers that have an infinite column is sigma zero three complete, okay? This means there are infinitely many J for a shorthand. And here I'm using, this is the standard uh, computable pairing function. from omega squared to omega. All right, also to simplify notation, let's do what I said earlier and just pretend the space we're living in is Cantor space. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I am gonna build a reduction from that complete set to my set A. And I'm going to approximate what the continuous reduction does in two ways. Um, I'm going to associate to each string a, another string row of s. And here the idea is that if some real x extends s, then f of x extends row of s. And this is where f going from Cantor space to Cantor space is the continuous reduction. Um, from our complete set to set A. Okay, so that we're all used to for making continuous functions. We send finite binary sequences to finite binary sequences, but I'm gonna have one other a uh, way of approximating f of x. And that is as follows. I'm also going to keep track at each stage of finitely many closed sets from my collection. Let's use k here. 
each of these FIS is inside my family of closed sets FNs. And the idea is that this is a current commitment that we have that f of x is going to be inside each of these closed sets. And in fact, I guess I said here that I want them to be decreasing. This commitment, though, is something that we're going to potentially injure in our priority argument. If eventually we start stabilizing what this first closed set is and the second closed set and the third closed set and so on, and we end up inside an infinite sequence of them, then by assumption, um, we're going to end up outside of A. Um, if we injure this process enough, though, then by meeting dense sets to end up inside this commeager set inside Fn to end up inside A, then we'll get the opposite outcome. Each of these closed sets is going to be associated to one of the columns in our real. If you like, here's a picture of one of our finite binary sequences, S, but we're writing it in 2D using our pairing function. As time goes on, we get more and more bits of our real X. And we're keeping track for each column of some closed set in this decreasing sequence. And the idea is that as we see more zeros, maybe each column is finite, and we keep building closed sets that we have to continue our construction inside. But each time we see a one show up in a column, I'm going to injure the commitment to be inside all later closed sets, and then meet some dense set inside um, fi if we're inside the ith column and we've seen a new one. And if I get to do that infinitely many times because some column is infinite, then we're going to end up inside A, since A is commeager in Fn. This, this is a really easy theorem. It's abstracting something we do all the time, and so I'm sure all of you could sit down and prove this in a couple minutes on your own. Um, the idea is that we have these two kinds of approximations at each stage, a finite string that we're committed to, and finitely many closed sets that we're trying to stay inside. But as we see in some column more and more ones show up, we keep uh, injuring the commitments to be inside later closed sets and instead meet open dense sets inside the particular closed set associated to this column. And uh, in the other case, if each column is finite, eventually the sequence of closed sets settles down and we end up inside infinitely many of these closed sets and hence uh, not inside A. Okay. Here's uh, a quick formal definition of rho and these FSs. If we see a new bit and it's a zero, we just extend our list of closed sets, remain inside all of them, and extend the finite string that we have. Oh, th this is notation for the basic open neighborhood. Determined by row of s. Okay, so our commitments have to be uh, compatible with each other in the sense that all the closed sets and the current basic open neighborhood we're committed to be inside have to have non-empty intersection. So if we see a new bit and it's a zero, we extend our list of closed sets. If we see a new bit and it's a one, we injure closed sets beyond the column where we've seen that. And instead we meet the next dense open set inside Fi sub s. And then as I said, our reduction is defined by taking the unions of these finite approximations. Okay. So the other direction uses uh, a beautiful but clever little lemma of Leo Harrington. And it's something specific about sigma zero three and beyond in the Borel hierarchy. If you have a sigma zero three set 
and a reduction of it, uh, and it's complete. And a reduction to some other set, you can all find another reduction that's injective. Um, and the injectiveness is precisely what you need to make the other direction of the theorem work. What you do is you first check that for some canonical sigma zero three complete set, there are a family of closed sets like this. So you could take the canonical complete set to be the C that we were working with. So you check that there exist closed sets like this for that C, and then you reduce C to any other sigma zero three hard set. You use Harrington's idea to make an injective reduction, and then you just take the image of these closed sets to make the family that you want. Since the continuous function on, on a compact set has a compact image, and in fact, it's an injection, you get a homeomorphism between the reduction and its range. All right, so that's the very simplest case of the phenomena that I wanna talk about. Um, what Adam and I do first is we generalize this theorem to every level in the Borel hierarchy. You can give an exact characterization of when a set is sigma zero n complete or sigma zero n hard more generally in terms of finding the right kind of families of sets that have the right density um, properties between them. And then the proof that that's uh, characterizes sigma zero and hardness, uses Montalban's true stages machinery to do a priority argument and uh, reduce some canonical complete set to this arbitrary other set. Okay, so you can state this generalized version of that folklore theorem um, using either forcing language if you want or topological language. And I'm gonna to choose topological language here. Here's some basic notation. If A is a countable collection of subsets of some Polish space, I'm gonna let tau sub A denote the topology generated by A as a subbasis. So open sets are unions of finite intersections of elements of A. Okay, so the precise definitions here aren't so important, but I'm defining a kind of sequence of sets, and in general, A0 is just going to be the Klopin set, say if you're working in Cantor space. A1 is going to be some pi 0, 1 sets, countably many. A2 is going to be some pi 0, 2 sets, and then AN is some pi 0, n sets. And I want sequences of sets of increasing complexity like this with a few very simple closure properties. So for instance, the collections have to increase at each stage. Um, I have to include all the Klopin sets in my pi zero one sets. I have to include all my pi zero one sets inside the pi zero two sets that I use and so on. So it's gonna turn out for instance, that if I take all the light face pi zero M sets at each level here, that'll be a suitable sequence. Here's the next simple property. If I have some set at the mth level, then its complement is at the next highest level. And this is ensuring that we don't get too complicated. Each set at the m plus one level is closed in the topology at the mth level. All right, so these are quite familiar. Um, if you've studied changes of topology in descriptive set theory, they're going to ensure, for example, that the topology generated by every collection in this level is Polish. Property four, though, the last property is um, quite hard to satisfy, and it's going to be the key kind of density criterion and relates to the levels in a way that allow the theorem to work. So if I'm at the m plus one level, and I take the closure in the level two topologies down. So this is the closure of B. In AM minus one. 
then that has to be a set in my AM level. So this set is going to be pi zero M plus one. I take the closure of that set inside the M minus one topology. And so that is always going to be a pi zero M set. But that pi zero M set has to be in this collection A sub M. One of the reasons four is very difficult to satisfy is that um, it means I can't just find a collection of sets with these four properties by trying to close off under all these um, various properties and countably steps, countably many steps, and hope to catch my tail. And the problem is that if I add a set at the m plus one level, this condition demands that I put a set at the previous level in. But then these conditions up here demand that um, these sets at the mth level puts additional objects into the m plus one level. And this will even happen after countably many steps. Um, so it's not clear to me, for instance, that if you take a countable model of ZFC, for instance, and let A sub n be all the pi zero n sets contained or that have codes inside it that you will have all these four properties. So even taking absurd amounts of, of closure, you still don't necessarily satisfy all these. But um, for instance, the light face pi zero n sets do, the ones with height parameters do, and th these will characterize sigma zero n completeness with an if and only if theorem. So here's the theorem. If I have some set Y, then it's sigma zero n plus one hard, if and only if there's a suitable sequence, so a collection of sets with these properties, these kind of nice density properties that uh, aren't so hard to verify, so that Y is meager in the topology generated at the nth level, and Y is co-meager inside each set in the n minus one topology at uh, the AN level. Okay, so this is a, a not such an easy theorem to absorb on your, your first look and the full complexity of this shows up first when you talk about com completeness for sigma zero five sets. Um, and after that, you, you've seen really the full generality of the theorem. Um, but I'll emphasize again, it's an if and only if theorem. And any time you're proving a completeness result in descriptive set theory, implicitly or explicitly, you're defining these countable collections of sets you're using as approximations to your reduction. And then you're doing a priority argument basically using true stages. And this is uh, necessarily true. I'll say a, a quick word about this priority argument at each stage. We're gonna have some approximation to f of x and it consists of a sequence of sets where the ith set in this collection comes from uh, the script AI. And true stages you use to control the flow of the construction. You'll have f of x is actually gonna be inside AI if, um, in here, you're thinking of X as extending S, if and only if the length of S is actually an I true stage during the construction. And I'll define what I mean by that in a second. All right, so here's the relativized lemma version of uh, Antonio's true stages machine that we use. So the true stages you might have seen are usually defined as partial orders on omega that are computable, but here they're going to be on finite strings. And these are orders that you can use to nicely control the flow of a priority construction. And I'm not going to go through all these very carefully. This condition is really the key one in the construction. And how it gets used in the proof is that this condition allows 
some bear category argument to work at a key point in, um, in the proof to ensure that the sequences that you have, uh, you're allowed to keep extending them to have non-empty intersection. Okay. Um, in a sense, by the way, in once you've moved to this relativized version on two to the less omega, there's a nice characterization of the true stages orders in that there, if you have any collection of um, partial orders on strings with these properties, there's a notion of one collection like this embedding into another collection like this. And the, the real true stages orders are the universal order with these five properties. Okay, so um, maybe that's a good time quickly to check if there's any questions. Um, the, because we're about to shift gears and talk about an application of this theorem. Um, this theorem characterizing exactly when a set um, is sigma zero n plus two hard at some level of the Borel hierarchy. Okay, so here's an application and the general question is what functions are piecewise continuous? So by piecewise continuous, I mean you can break it up into pieces and on each piece you have some partial continuous function. So in general, I wanna think about piecewise continuous functions where I'm allowed countably many pieces and the way I'm going to measure complexity of this kind of decomposition into continuous functions is how complicated the domains are. So let's suppose for a second that the domains of each of these partial continuous functions are delta zero n. And let's do an easy calculation. If you have a continuous function the preimage of any sigma zero one set is sigma zero one, and the preimage of any sigma zero n set is sigma zero n, just following through the definitions of the sets in the Borel hierarchy. And so, if you have a function and it's piecewise continuous, if I have a sigma zero n set and I take its inverse image, the inverse image is going to be relatively sigma zero n inside the domain. And of course, the intersection of a sigma zero n and a delta zero n set is still sigma zero n. And so if I take the full preimage of the sigma zero n set under my function, it's the union of all of those countably many sigma zero n sets, and hence it's sigma zero n. So this is a triviality. If you have a function like this, which is piecewise continuous and all the domains of the partial continuous functions it's built out of are delta n, then in fact, the preimage of every sigma zero n set is sigma zero n. It was conjectured in the mid 2000s by various authors that in fact, that should be an if and only of characterization of this kind of piecewise continuity. A function f is a countable union of continuous functions with delta n zero, zero n domains, if and only if the preimage of every sigma zero n set is sigma zero n. Here's a slightly more general conjecture. There's a standard way of measuring the complexity of Borel functions. So f is what's called bear class zero if it's continuous. And bear class n if it is a limit of bear class n minus one functions this is the definition you typically see, but um, as a logician, I kind of prefer the following if and only if the preimage of every open set 
is sigma zero n plus one. which basically is the same thing as saying that f has a sigma zero n plus one definition as a function. So if you measure the complexity of the function of Borel functions using the Borel hierarchy, this is the natural notion of, of complexity that you get. And you can generalize this little argument that we just gave and make the conjecture more generally about bare class m functions instead of just continuous functions. And then this conjecture about piecewise continuity becomes a special case. Okay, so the theorem is that this decomposability conjecture is true, assuming, um, and in fact, this should be pi one two, not sigma one two, just term of C. Um, well, I, I, I guess that's the same thing. All right, so, I want to talk a little bit about how we prove the conjecture using this characterization of when a set is um, sigma zero and hard. Um, first, let me mention some prior progress on this decomposability conjecture. Jane and Rogers proved that it's true for n equal two. A function is um, piecewise continuous on delta zero two or actually equivalently closed domains if and only if the preimage of every sigma zero two set is sigma zero two. Um, the motivation for Jane and Rogers, I think, was some application in Bonnock space theory. Um, and this theorem, as far as I know, was kind of forgotten for a while until uh, people started working on similar things again. Uh, the decomposability conjecture was proved at the level n equals three by Dean Kihara, Semis, and Zhao in 2018. And the theorems are proved the following way. Of course, we already did one direction of them, essentially. So we want to prove the other direction. Assume the preimage, say, of every sigma zero n set is sigma zero n, and I want to show that you have to be piecewise continuous. But um, of course, it's a lot easier actually to prove the contrapositive. Suppose you have this function and it's not the right kind of, uh, doesn't have the right kind of decomposition. Then I wanna show that it's not the case that say the preimage of every sigma zero n set is sigma zero n. And so what I do is construct a set that's simple, but whose preimage is not. And the way I prove the preimage is not simple is by showing that it's pi zero n hard say, to show that it's not sigma zero n. Okay, so of course we prove the theorem in general using the same idea. Um, in fact, if you wanna prove the decomposability conjecture in general, it's enough to consider the case where m equals n plus one. And the idea here is that if you're allowed to knock the bare class of the function down by one, you can iteratively do that um, step by step and the domains on which you find the decompositions are gonna get more and more complicated. You'll start with delta zero two and then delta zero three and so on. And then it, you'll end at the, uh, after n steps with this conjecture, say. Okay, so using a pretty simple argument, it's enough to consider this case. Okay, so I wanna make a brief remark about changing topology. So if we have a topology on a Polish space, let's think about making a new topology. What I'm about to say, you could also translate into forcing and say, let's think about forcing with some countable collection of pi zero n sets, but I'm gonna try and stick to topological language here. So we, we had an original topology and now we're changing to a topology generated by some pi zero n sets. So here's a quick calculation. Any sigma zero one set, any open set in our new topology is a countable union of basic open sets in the old topology, but those basic open sets are pi zero n. 
All right, so a sigma zero one set in the new topology is sigma zero n plus one in the old. Okay, so then if you trace through any definition of a Borel set, you're in terms of the new topology to the old topology, you're knocking up the complexity by n levels. All right, and now let me just write the contrapositive of this. If A is not sigma zero n plus k in the old topology, it's definitely not sigma zero k in the new topology. Okay, so this is a, a trivial observation. And what I want to emphasize here is that converses of these statements are extremely false. Um, here's a bad analogy from computability theory, which has some precise connection by uh, the usual techniques. Let's say you have some real X and it can compute the kth turn jump. Then X to the N can compute zero to the N plus K. Okay, so this is my version of this statement. Um, what I want to emphasize here is that maybe it'll help to think about the converse here, which is very false again. Suppose x to the n can compute 0 to the n plus k, then it's certainly not the case that x can always compute 0 to the k. Okay. All right. However, the way we prove decomposability is hoping that the converse is true, even though it's very much not true. So here's a very naive attempt at proving decomposability. Suppose you have some function and it's not assumed to not be a union of bare class n minus one functions with delta n domains. Well, one thing I could try is changing the topology to make everything simpler. I can make um, some pi zero n minus one sets in my old topology, some new basic open sets. And now I've definitely know still that this function now is not a union of bare class one functions. If these functions were bare class one inside my new topology generated by sigma zero n minus one sets, they'd be bare class n minus one in the original topology. All right, so now this is a situation where we have the decomposability conjecture proved already. And so I can apply this result of Ding, Kihara, Semis, and Zhao and obtain some sigma zero two set whose preimage is too complicated, whose preimage is not sigma zero three. And then, and this is the ridiculous part, I could hope that that set, which is not sigma zero three in my new topology, is not sigma zero n in the old one. This is the converse here that is just doesn't work in general. But of course, there's always hope. When I realized that uh, Adam and I were basically, this was our outline of, of the idea of our proof, um, we got really scared and almost immediately tried to work on other things because this just should never work. You never prove theorems like this in descriptive set theory. But in this situation, um, you can just keep trying over and over and over again and eventually it does work. And what you do is that each time this idea fails, we get some canonical new pi zero n minus two set to add to our change of topology. Um, the change of topology is being plugged into this theorem characterizing sigma zero n completeness. And to know that it's canonical, um, that I can define it in some nice definable way that doesn't depend on choices of enumerations of uh, the topologies that I'm using here to do this change requires some careful analysis of, of Ding, Kihara, Semis, and Zhao's proof. But what we do is we take this new set and then we just try this silly idea again and again and again. And eventually we have to succeed after some countable ordinal number of steps. And the reason is, if not, we would contradict the following theorem of Leo Harrington. 
there's no omega-1 length sequence of distinct pi zero alpha sets, assuming determinacy. I didn't know this theorem. Um, you might know a simple version of it. Assume AD, there's no omega-1 length sequence of distinct reals. But in fact, um, set theorists uh, in the good old days were studying the longest length sequence of distinct this, that, or the other, and Harrington proved this beautiful theorem. Um, that proves that our construction eventually has to terminate. Okay, so I want to end in just one more minute, but by noticing that this is just ridiculous. Um, you shouldn't use pi 1, 2 determinacy to prove a very simple fact about piecewise continuous functions that are bare class n. Um, there's no way you really need this much determinacy. And in fact, uh, we know what we should do. There's a very standard toolbox of tricks um, around Gandhi Harrington forcing using the reflection theorem and other ideas like that to find the right sets to begin with. Instead of just getting a contradiction by saying if we keep trying to build them and we fail, um, we contradict this theorem, you should just build the right ones at the outset that you're going to plug into this theorem characterizing sigma zero and hardness. And in fact, there's some good prototypes to start with. Louveau has a beautiful theorem where he analyzes sets that are light face delta one one and bold face sigma zero alpha. And in fact, if you look carefully in that um, proof, what he's doing is showing that um, he makes nice topologies of bold face sigma zero alpha sets that have height parameters as light face delta one one sets, and he shows they form a suitable sequence in our sense. Um, This should be the right starting point to find um, the correct sets from the outset so that you don't have to use this theorem to finish and that you can get rid of the determinacy hypothesis. But this is still an open question. Um, I'll end there. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Andrew. Um, um, it's uh, a round of uh, um, digital applause, um, and I'll ask whether there are any questions to Andrew. Uh, if you have, please just unmute yourselves and um, ask. Oh, hi. Uh, how about you know going past the uh, the integer and through omega and beyond the recursive ordinals? Yeah, that's I'll, an I'll excellent take the question. answer offline. Um, so we've worked out carefully the cases um, where alpha is a limit ordinal, and you do alpha plus two, alpha plus three, and so on. So this is alpha limit, and um, alpha itself is easy and because that is characterized in terms of all countably many completeness theorems for the levels below it. The hard one is alpha plus one. And there's in fact a precise connection in some sense to maybe old theorems around Posner-Robinson where it's um, getting the right theorem at exactly the limit level kind of corresponds to the same problem you encounter trying to get the right theorem here. And so Adam and I hadn't written down exactly the right dichotomy theorem right here. So um, we think we know what it should be, but we haven't um, finished the write-up. But every all the other limit ordinals are OK. Oh, sorry, all the other infinite countable ordinals are OK. Just limits plus one is, is a strangely sticky, sticky point. <laughs>